Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 10. We're going to be talking about how Jesus send, sent out the 72. We're going to be talking about the, the parable of the Good Samaritan and at the home of Martha and Mary. Let's start off with verse 1. Now, after these things, the Lord also appointed 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him. It says literally before his face into every city and place where he was about to come. And notice Jesus sent out people before him to basically almost like John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord. And uh, it says in verse 2, Then he said to, the, to them, The harvest indeed is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest, that he may send out laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Okay, so let, let's, let's just stop here for a second again. What is Jesus talking about? The harvest is plentiful. He's talking about those who are ready to hear the word of God, to hear about God's ways and God's, you know, laws and God's precepts, to hear the good news and to accept it, to actually obey it. Okay? So it says laborers are few. Not too many people actually want to go out and really preach the gospel really teach other people about the ways of the Lord. So it says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send out laborers into his harvest. So, you know, yes, you know, uh, pray that the Father would, would send out lots of people into the harvest, into the field of the world to harvest the people who are ready, that want, they're ready to, to hear the message of the gospel. And we all know the message of the gospel is first and foremost, repent and then believe, okay? So um, it's very simple uh, to repent of your sins, to repent of the, of the things that you do against the law of God as, as it's spelled out to us in the scriptures. And so uh, there, there is a, a shortage of laborers and we need to pray that God would send out laborers into the field. And that's just, that's a ministry all by itself. That's a mission field all by itself to pray that God would send out laborers. Verse 3, Jesus said, Go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. So these people are vicious. These people are not very safe. But, God, but you know, Jesus said, uh, you know, basically he blessed them. Go your way. I send you out as lambs among wolves. Verse 4, carry no purse, nor wallet, nor sandals. Greet no one on the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this home. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Again, let me stop here for a second. And I know we, we talked about this in previous uh, chapters. Why did Jesus say, don't even take your purse? Don't take a wallet and don't take sandals. It's like, I know a lot of people would be worried. I have no money, absolutely nothing. I don't even have uh, shoes on my feet. But you need to understand the way things operated there, with the way things, um, the way things worked. Jesus sent out his disciples. Uh, you know, his, it says here it was 70 others, okay, um, he sent out 70 of his disciples. In another translation, it says it's uh, 72 disciples. But uh, nevertheless, he sent them out. And he didn't want them to just go, you know, with all they need. Because he wanted them to work for for you know what they need really basically because they went from city to city their their job was to find a worthy house to stay at somebody who was righteous somebody who's worthy of um uh, of their presence somebody who who is really supportive of them uh who uh, uh who really is a godly you know a godly person or a godly family a home and when you stay there you know you're actually you're getting lodging you're getting you expect that person to feed you 
But you don't do it for free. Jesus, uh, you know, in context, you actually w- did something. You worked for that family. Be it going out t- into the field and working in the field, doing something around the home, doing something, some kind of work where you actually earned your lodging and your food. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about carrying a purse. Don't take no money. Don't even carry sandals. In another place, I know in another scripture, he says, don't even take extra changes of clothes because, you know, if you do a good job, they're going to prepare, they're going to, they're, they are going to provide for all that. Okay. So let's continue with verse seven. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking the things they give for the labor is worthy of his wages. Now, remember, they're not going to give anything just to eat because this is in context, you know, this, these homes are Jewish homes. Uh, they're not going to just give you anything to eat and drink. They're going to give you, a, you know, what's uh, what's accor- according to the law of God, what should be eaten and what should not be eaten. You know, of course, the, the unclean foods would not be served, obviously. It would be a, 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 great, um, a great blasphemy to do so, so to speak. So uh, he said, remain in that house. In other words, don't just... You know, settle in the house. Don't go from house to house, you know, one house one night and one house another night. No, settle in a good, you know, settle down for, you know, at least, you know, a a number of nights in in a certain home. It says, eating and drinking the things they give for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Don't go from house to house. So there we go again. Jesus expected his people to work, uh, to do things uh, on, you know, for the the person or, or for the family uh, in whose home they're, they're staying. So they, they actually worked for their lodging and their food. Verse 8, Into whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat the things that, that are set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them God's kingdom has come near to you. But in whatever city you enter and they don't receive you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust from your city that clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that God's kingdom has come near to you. I tell you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than, than for that city. So, it's a very serious sin to not receive the words of a, of a man of God. A man of God comes to your city to preach. What did they preach? And we, you know, we read it in other Gospels. The first thing they preached was repentance. Repent. You know, repent of your sin. Live right for God. They preached righteousness. You know, and those who did not receive them, it says that they are so bad God condemns them to the uttermost, even to the point where you you can say the place that you were, you know, where these people are, the dust of that place is not even worthy to be on the bottom of your feet. And it says here it's more tolerable in that day than uh, for Sodom than for that city. Verse 13, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Let me just stop here again. Now, a lot of people think that Jesus is just this, you know, hippie guy, you know, that just goes around loving and blessing everybody and hugging trees and giving, blowing everybody a kiss. No, he spoke blessings upon certain people. Yes, there are conditions to the blessings. But the opposite of a blessing is a curse or a woe, okay? Jesus, Jesus called down curses or woes upon individuals, upon groups of people. And here we see that Jesus actually called down cursing upon entire cities. Entire cities here. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were done in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So you see, Right here, he makes it very clear that the purpose of the miracles here were, is the, the purpose of all of his great and wonderful miracles was to bring people to repentance. That was the purpose. And for them to be humble, to sit in sackcloth and ashes, okay? Why is that? What does sackcloth and ashes mean? Well, sackcloth is, is burlap, 
okay? When people put on sackcloth, they put on the most uncomfortable clothes you can ever imagine. Uncomfortable clothes. They afflicted themselves and sat in ashes, which reminded them that everything one day will end up to be nothing but ashes, dust. Okay? And that's where humility comes in. When you realize that all of the material things, your, even, even your own fleshly body and even your own fleshly desires and fleshly lusts will end up in nothing but ashes one day. Okay? God said, just as he flooded the earth in the days of Noah, you know, and he set the rainbow as a sign that he would not f f um, flood the earth again, but it says in, 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 the, book, in the letter of Peter and also in the, in the letter of Jude, it says that the flood of Noah uh, is basically just the first stage of God's judgment. The second stage is just like the world was destroyed in a flood, so the world will be destroyed with fire. First comes the water, then comes the fire. Right now we sit in between those two events, okay? Uh, so ashes remind you that fire is coming. And it says in Jude, it also says, I believe in Second Peter, that Sodom and Gomorrah is just an example of what is to come in the future, okay? A lot of people think, oh, God doesn't judge anymore. He's not this, what, this God of vengeance like you see in the, in the, in the uh, so-called Old Testament. That's not what the Bible says. That is what fake Christianity teaches. That's not what the Bible says. That's what feel-good preachers preach, okay? Verse 14, but it will, it will be more tolerable for, uh, for Tyre and, and Sidon in the judgment than for you. You, Capernaum, again, Capernaum is, is, comes from a Hebrew word, kafer, Nahum, which means kafer, village, Nahum, Nahum. This is the prophet Nahum's own hometown. You, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven. In other words, you're so proud. It doesn't mean literally they are up in heaven. Of course not. They're on earth. But when they say you're exalted to heaven, they're full of pride. Okay? You will be brought down to hell. You will be brought down to Hades. Or in other words, you will be brought down to the dead, okay? To hell. And some people would call it even the grave. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Okay, this is very important to understand. When when you see some old guy out there preaching repentance and you think he's some lunatic, nutcase, well, just remember. He who listens to him listens to Jesus. Jesus said to these people, He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me, God the Father. Okay? So it's a very, very serious thing not to listen to the preachers who are preaching repentance, preaching the kingdom of God, who are preaching hard and strong against sin, preaching the ways and the, 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 the precepts and instructions of God. Verse 17, the 70 returned with joy. Okay, so they already went out. They already did their job. They already did the ministry. Now it says they returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons, even the evil spirits, even the evil spirits are subject to us in your name. Now, let me also interject this, that just because it says in your, in your name, it doesn't mean that they actually literally have to say in the name of Jesus all the time. It means when Jesus sent them out with, with certain instructions, they obeyed. And just the act of obeying was doing it in the name of Jesus, okay? You don't have to literally, there's so many people that says in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, when it's not really in the name of Jesus. Just because you recite the phrase in the name of Jesus doesn't mean you're actually doing it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus means you're doing it on his be, in, in, in his behalf, okay? You're doing it because he commanded you to do it. You're doing it with his authority, with his backing, under his command, under his guidance, you are representing him. That's what that means. So the, the, the 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the evil spirits, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
He said to them, I saw Satan fall, having fallen like lightning from heaven. Behold. In other words, let me just stop here. In other words, you think that it's awesome that the evil spirits are subject to you? Well, you know what? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Satan being the ruler of all of the evil spirits. Verse 19, Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Of course, again, this doesn't mean literally and biologically serpents and scorpions. These are images of evil spirits. These are images of evil. Nothing will in any way hurt you. Wow, what a comforting thing to say. Verse 20. Now, again, let me just before I go ahead. When you do the will of God, I'm talking about when you do the will of God. Not when you sit at home, just sitting home doing nothing. Not just thinking about it. Not just reading the Bible. But when you're doing it. When you do the will of God. Nothing will in any way hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, that's the, that's the most important thing that you should be rejoicing about. Not that evil spirits are subject to you, but that you are actually obeying God. You're actually doing His will. You're actually considered righteous. You are. You have attained uh, that place of obedience where He would say, you know what? You have repented of your sin. You have believed. You are obeying me, and your names are written in heaven. That is, that's more powerful than, than any kind of miracle of casting out evil spirits. Verse 21. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Now, I said this long, many times before, but this doesn't literally always mean a literal 60-minute hour, okay? And some people take it so legalistically, so literally. It just means, you know, in that, during that time frame, during, around that time, in the same hour, that's what it means. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father. I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for so it was well-pleasing in your sight. Again, you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's not literally it doesn't literally mean uh, it doesn't literally mean god's wisdom and god's understanding it means wisdom and understanding according to the ways of the world okay the the, the knowledge of the world okay you have hidden these things jesus said from the wise and understanding from those who are wise in the in the you know in the, in the sight of the world understanding in the sight of the world and have re, and have revealed them to little children in other words, you humble yourself like a little child. You listen to the, the Word of God like a little child would listen to his father. And, uh, you know, you will get revelation. You will get the things of God shown you that you would never have thought possible. So Jesus said, yes, Father. So it, it, it was well-pleasing in your sight. So God loves to hide some of the most profound things from some of the most knowledgeable people in the, in the sight of the world. And reveal it to little children. Reveal it to those who are like a little child in the name of the Lord. Verse 22. Turning to the disciples, he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and he who the Father and, and who the Father is except the Son, and he to whomever the Son desires to reveal him. Very powerful verse here. This goes to show you there are special people. Let me see. Let me just read it again. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. That's pretty simple. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. And he to whomever the Son desires to reveal him. Now, it doesn't say that no one knows the, who the Son is except the Father, and the Father is except the Son, and 
and and everyone because everyone will the, the Jesus chooses everyone to have that re, the revelation. That's not what it says. He to whomever the, the Son desires to reveal him, which means there are special people that are picked out. Obviously, uh, verse twenty three. Turn to the turning to the disciples. He said privately. Again, you need to understand what he said publicly and what he said privately. This is privately for the disciples. Blessed are the eyes which think, which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see the things which you see and didn't see them, and to hear the things which you hear and didn't hear them. And I, you know, I'm telling you, don't you wish you would have seen the things they saw and heard the things they heard too? Wow. 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested, tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what a question. A lot of people ask that same question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to be saved? Jesus had the perfect, perfect opportunity here to preach the, what I call the modern day corrupt gospel. He he could have had made, you know, he could have, he had the perfect opportunity to say, well, all you got to do is just come and just pray the sinner's prayer, believe in me and all is well. Don't worry about your sin. It's covered. He could have said that. He had the perfect chance to say that. He had the perfect chance to say, well, you know, right now it's different, but, you know, after I die and raise and rise again and, you know, in about another, you know, uh, maybe another two, three years, things are going to be a whole lot different for you guys. So I'll, I'll just give you a forewarning. He could have said that. Nope. 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 He had all the opportunity to say, well, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out because I'll never cast anybody out no matter what the circumstance or context is. That's not what he said. And I know a lot of you know that he said the first part of that phrase that I just said. But there is context to what he said. He had the perfect opportunity to say anything he wanted to say here. And he had the perfect opportunity to preach the modern day corrupt Christian gospel. What did he say? Verse 26. What is written in the law? What's the Torah say? How do you read it? How do you understand it? And so the man said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, I know somebody who said, all you got to do is just love the Lord God and love your neighbor, and that's all you got to do. You don't have to do anything else in, in, in the Bible. That's a total, that's just total nonsense. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You know, if you love God, you will obey him. What are the commands to obey? There are lots of commands to obey. Are they hard? Not really. If you deny yourself and you are, you know, you repent, No. You know, Deuteronomy 30 at the very end of the Torah, so to speak, you know, um, wrapping things up. God says, what I command, all the law and all the all the, the stuff that I commanded you, they're, they're, it's easy. You don't have to build a, a building up to heaven. You don't have to dig down to the core of the earth to, to, to obey me. It's right there. It's right in your, in your heart. It's right. The word is right there. It's easy for you. God is, doesn't bark out commands that, that he knows that the recipients cannot fulfill. So in order to, I mean, yes, you got, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, my, uh, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But what does that look like? Let me tell you what it looks like. Obedience. Righteousness according to God's word. Not a righteousness that, that, that nobody can see. There's a lot of people, a lot of Christians out there that are walking around and saying, I have the righteousness of Christ. Well, nobody would ever know. If you really have the righteousness of Christ, you will shine like the sun. You will stand out. You will be holy. You won't talk like the world talks. 
You won't walk like the world walks. You won't look like the world looks. You won't think like the world thinks. You'll be holy. Verse 29, but he, that's the man, desiring to justify himself. Doesn't this remind you of so much of what we see today? But he, desiring to justify himself, asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to love my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Define that. Give me a de definition here. Jesus answered, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and uh, who both stripped him and beat him and, and departed, and le uh, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest was going down that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, some of the most holy people here, we got the priest, we got the Levite. In the same way, a Levite also, uh, at least not, at least supposed to be holy people, put it that way. A Levite also, when he came to the place he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, now you need to realize that Samaritans were, not, were pretty frowned upon in those days. I understand they were like Jewish half-breeds. Uh, they weren't full, you know, 100% Jewish. They were like a half-breed Jew, and they were really frowned upon in those days. But a certain Samaritan, again, as being a half-bred Jew, a lot of people considered them to be not worthy of the kingdom of God. But a certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion, came to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when they departed, he took out two denarii. We know that a denarii is about a day's wages, so that's about two days', days wages of money. Gave it to the host and said, take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond that, I will repay when I return. Now, which of these three do you, see, do you think seemed to, to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? He said, he who, sh who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. As they went on their way, he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary. Now we know that uh, this word Mary here is not in the original Hebrew is Miriam. Who, was, who also sat at Jesus' feet hearing his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Ask her, therefore, to help me. Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you are, so, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. The good part is not to be worried and anxious, troubled about many things, and just it's it's kind of like a pseudo service because Mary Martha was trying to serve, but it was it was more of um, an anxious thing. It wasn't really a service that she was doing to the Lord. It wasn't really serving from from her heart. More of just an anxious. She was just anxious and troubled about many things. But Mary was just sitting there soaking up every single word the Lord said. You know, as it says in the scriptures, what does the Lord want? What does he desire? What is he looking what what is he looking for? He's looking for the one who trembles at his word. So as you go and think about this reading and thinking about this chapter, remember to pray the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into the field to preach the gospel of repentance. Remember to be like Mary, who sits at Jesus' feet just soaking up every single word he says. As you meditate upon what we just read, may God bless you and open the eyes of your understanding to see great and mighty things. God said, ask of me and I will show you great and mighty things. So be blessed as you go and meditate upon his scriptures throughout the rest of your day and into your evening in the name of of Yeshua.
Thanks again for watching.